Hi, I'm Glenn Rogers, and this is Biblical Insights. The title of our video today is A Unified Church? With a question mark at the end, as in, are we a unified church, or is the church unified? So that's what we're going to talk about today. And I, I decided to, to make this video uh, a few weeks ago when we were doing our series on uh, prayers of Jesus. And one of the main passages for that series was Jesus' prayer that's recorded by John in John 17. It's the longest prayer in the New Testament. And um, un unless you count some of the psalm types of things in the, one of the Gospels, uh, but if you if you just you know a straight up prayer that somebody's praying in the normal fashion, uh, John seventeen is is the longest prayer in the New Testament, and in that prayer Jesus uh, talked uh, about the church. Uh, the first part of the prayer is is his prayer for himself. The second part of the prayer is his prayer for his apostles, and in the third and longest section of the prayer. He prays for the church, and he puts it in terms of those who will believe because of the work of the apostles. And, and so that's us. That's all successive generations of believers uh, who, who are Christians because of the work that the apostles did after uh, Jesus was resurrected and ascended back to heaven. But in that prayer... Jesus prayed for the unity of his uh, believers. He, he wanted all Christians to be unified, unified with him and with the Father and with each other. And so we have a simple question to ask, you know, is the church today a unified church? Are believers unified in belief and practice? And of course, I, I, I think anybody who's even remotely familiar with the Christian church today is going to know that the, <laughs> we are not. No, we are not. And so it, it's kind of an odd thing, and I think many people don't think of it in these terms, but we would typically think uh, about all of Jesus' prayers uh, as being answered by God. In other words, if you know, if Jesus prays for something, Father, I need this, or I need to do that, or I hope you'll do this, or whatever, that the Father would say, absolutely, yes, and he would answer that prayer in a positive way and do what Jesus asked. And most of the time he did, but this time he didn't. Jesus prayed that his church would be unified, and his church is not unified. Well, why didn't God answer that prayer? Well, because part of the problem uh, is with the human beings, with us. We're the problem. You see, if, if you say, why isn't the church unified? Well, is it something about the concept of church that makes it impossible for, for it to be a, a, a unified body of believers? No, there's nothing wrong with the concept. Well, is there something that God did that didn't work out right? He did it wrong, and there's why it's... No, nothing like that. Well, maybe Jesus did something wrong or, or, or didn't fix this or fix that. Maybe... It, yeah, no, it's, it's not Jesus' fault. It's, it's not conceptually problematic. It's not a problem with God. It's not a problem with Jesus. It wasn't a problem with the apostles. If the church isn't unified, that's on us. Okay? The church is divided and split up terribly because of Christians, because we seem to be unable to get along with each other and agree with each other about what the Bible says and what's important and what we should believe and how we should worship and what our mission in the world is. Because we can't agree, we can't get along, the church isn't unified. And Jesus knew that it would be a, a benefit that the church would be stronger and more influential and better able to serve people in the world if it was a unified church. You see, And that's why he prayed that it would be a unified church, but we won't 
cooperate with God to make that happen, and so we don't have a unified church. That's a shame, and it's, it's really too bad that we're getting in the way of one of Jesus' concerns and one of the things that he prayed for. Well, is there anything to be done about it? O over the years, lots of people have, have tried, you know, back in the 1500s, early 1500s, many church leaders realized that the Catholic Church had become so, so ruined and, and had turned so far away from the Bible and was practicing things that were just not right, that they tried to reform the broken church. They tried to reform it. And so we have what's called the Reformation Movement. Well, that didn't really work out all that well. They made some progress and, and some good things happened there, but the, the Reformation churches ended up being, from one point of view, just as messed up as the Catholic Church ever was, and, and they weren't getting the job done. And so in the late 1700s, a couple hundred years later, um, another group of people came along and said, you know, the, the church, we couldn't re reform it. It was so broken, we couldn't reform it. So we need to restore it. And so after the Reformation movement came another movement unique to America, it happened here in America, called the Restoration Movement. And uh, they tried to just toss out everything, go back to the, to the beginning and start over and reestablish the New Testament church. And, and conceptually, that was a fine idea, except what they didn't foresee, what they didn't anticipate is that it was going to run into the same problems that the original church ran into, and, and that is uh, us, human nature people who can't agree, who can't get along. And so the, the very movement that said, we're going to establish a new hermeneutic and make it possible for people to follow this one single way of interpreting the Bible, and that will answer all the questions and solve all the problems, and the church can be united finally after all this. Well, it didn't work either, because even the restoration movement couldn't remain unified, and they broke into three different groups right? And uh, it, just, it, it, it just has been a mess for 2,000 years. Uh, you know, in, in some ways, uh, some aspects of Christianity work together very well, but in other ways, we're still very divided. So is there some way we can address this issue? And uh, I, you know, maybe, I, I think that's the, the best answer to give. Maybe there's a passage in the New Testament from the Apostle Paul, and I think maybe if we used it as, as kind of a guideline, that maybe it would make the job of, of reuniting the church um, a little easier. And, and so we're going to read a passage here in a moment from the Simplified New Testament, and it's from the book of Ephesians from the Apostle Paul, the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, and it's verses 4 through 6. And what I'm suggesting here uh, is that Paul lists a, a number of things that there's just one of these things, okay? And, and I'm thinking maybe if we follow the idea that if, if we focus just on these one the, the things, you know, a group of seven things of which there's only one of each of them, then, it, it, and if they become our criteria for unity, then, you know, maybe we could put aside some of the division and, and be unified. Maybe. I don't know. You'll, you'll have to think about it and decide for yourself. But let's read this text and see what Paul has to say, and then we'll talk about it some more. Paul says, after all, there is just one body and one Holy Spirit. When you were called out of the world, it was to one hope. There is only one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God, who is the Father and the ruler of all there is. Now, notice what he, what he says there. Look at what, what's in this list. One body, all right, that's the same as the church. The church is the body of Christ. Christ the head of the body, okay? 
All right, so there, there, there's one church, one body, all right? That's one thing. And there's one Holy Spirit. That's the second thing. And when you were called out of the world, it was to one hope. So there's, there's hope, one hope. And there's only one Lord, Jesus. One faith, faith in him. One baptism, right? Immersion in water for the forgiveness of sins. And one God, who is the father of all. Okay, so the church or the body, the Holy Spirit, hope, Lord, faith, baptism, and God. Seven things. And there's only one of each of those seven things. So I'm wondering if maybe if we think in terms of getting along and, and we focus on these things, what, what do we believe and practice regarding these seven things, if we could all come together and agree on these seven things, maybe we could be united in the way Jesus wanted us to be united. Now, it, it isn't necessary that every single group of believers be uniform in the sense that every single one says the same thing the same way, believes it, and acts and worships exactly, you know, that everything has to be exactly uniform. Jesus didn't pray for uniformity. He prayed for unity. And, and there's a difference between those two things. And uh, we, we don't need uniformity. Uh, I, I know in different places, uh, the worship assembly may look a little different okay uh in in some places in some churches when it's time for the collection or the offering uh people will go to a location and leave it put it there walk up front and put it there walk in the back put it there in other places they will pass around plates and let you put it in your plate all right it, so it doesn't look the same does it have to look the same uh, no i don't i don't think so in some churches they project the song, the words of the songs up on a screen so that people can read them. In other places, they, they have a song book and they sing out of a song book. In some places, people just know the words and they sing them. Uh, okay, um, does it all have to look exactly the same in order for it to be acceptable to God? No, I, I, I don't think so. Um, in in uh, some places, uh, they will immerse people in a river or a stream. In other places, they will um, immerse them in a bathtub or a swimming pool. In some churches, they have a special baptistry and they immerse people there. Um, th does it all have to look exactly the same? Well, no, I, I, I don't think so. You know, what's more important? The, the, where, where the water is? whether it's in a bathtub or a swimming pool or a baptistry or a river or a stream, or the fact that there's water and the person is immersed for the forgiveness of sins. You see, but we have to focus on what's really important here. You see, um, when we have, you know, one Lord and one faith, you know, that's, that's the Lord Jesus and belief in him as our savior, you know, God in the flesh, that, that doesn't allow for, uh, other gods. It doesn't allow for other people, you know, like Muhammad or Confucius or uh, any, anybody else. You know, it's just the Lord, just Jesus. That's all. And there's one faith. There are not many faiths. There's only one faith. And somebody who stands up and says, well, there are many faiths, and that's just fine. No, it's not. It's not fine. The Bible says there's one faith. Okay? And that's something we have to agree on. There's just one. There's only one church. There's only one Lord. There's only one Holy Spirit. There's only one baptism. And that is immersion for the forgiveness of sins so that you can be forgiven and added to the church. So you, you see, we have some work to do. We're going to have to figure out how to apply this text and, 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 and learn to agree. And, and some of us are going to have to change our thinking some of us are going to have to change our behavior. But what's more important? What, what we think, what we want, what we believe, or what Jesus wanted? You see, he prayed for a unified church. 
And he's not getting one, at least not now, because we tend to think that what we want, what we believe, what we think we should is more important than what Jesus wanted. Maybe we need to rethink that idea. Maybe, maybe we need to think about the church as it existed originally and, and try to be like that church and all of the different traditions and additions and all this other stuff that over the last 2,000 years has been added in. Maybe we need to think in terms of, <coughs> excuse me, of, of those things as, as something we should let go of. You know, and, and, and go back and try to be simple New Testament Christians, believing what Jesus taught, doing what the first Christians did, and trying to make a difference in the world. And, and all the other stuff maybe is less important. So think about this text and what it says and, and how we might apply it. And think about Jesus' prayer in John 17. If you haven't read that recently, go back and read it again. Read the whole thing. Just read the, just read the whole thing. And you'll get to the part where Jesus is praying for his followers, for, for his disciples, for the church. And read what it says about his desire for them to be unified. And then think about this concept. How, how do we become a unified church? Because we're not now. And, and we haven't been for a very, very, very long time. I'm talking about 2,000 years. Okay? How do we pull this off? How do, we, how do we become the body that Jesus wants us to be, the church he wants us to be, the church he prayed for, the church he asked God for? How, how can we help him have that church? It's not going to be easy. Not going to be easy at all. But it's, it's something that we should think about and pray about. So, as you go through your week, read your Bible, pray, go to church, and may God bless.